when Karen first contacted me about doing this, uh, she proposed a debate but then later said she couldn't find anybody to debate me, so I'm here just as a panel of one. So I'm not sure what that meant. Either maybe uh, my opponents regard me as so formidable that they don't want to take me on. I think more likely they see me as an inconsequential lightweight. It's not worth it. But in any case, here I am, panel of one. Um, new world of Aboriginal property rights. Uh, we say in the beginning, which is, from my point of view, 1968, which is when I immigrated to Canada. Um, so that's uh, three, almost 50 years ago, not quite. Uh, governments uh, were thought to have ownership and control over all Crown lands. And most of Canada uh, was Crown land. Now, I'm not saying that's a, a, a wonderful thing. I actually, a little bit skeptical of... Uh, socialist ownership of land as I am of socialist ownership of other assets. But that's the way it was, that um, governments were thought to have a clear title to, to crown land. And that was understood to have been achieved in different ways in different parts of Canada. In, um, in Ontario and the Three Prairie Provinces and northeastern British Columbia and in the Mackenzie Valley, it was thought to have been achieved by the negotiation of land surrender treaties, which contain explicit wording about the um, at a time called Indians, Indians uh, ceding their Indian title to the crown. Um, in British Columbia, it was thought to have been achieved by uh, adverse occupancy. There hadn't been explicit treaties or any kind of treaties in most of the province, but uh, the colonial and then provincial government had acted over a very long period of time in ways that presupposed ownership and control of the land. So the courts had come to accept that as uh, based on a theory of adverse occupancy, having the effect of extinguishing Indian title. And then in Quebec and uh, Atlantic Canada, it was more confused because uh, the original contact was with the French crown, and the French really had not recognized native ownership. Uh, they had assigned reserves in some cases. Um, the land came to Canada through British sovereignty. So there's this very convoluted chain of sovereignty there. And, but in any case, it was, it was assumed that uh, Indian title had been extinguished in Atlantic Canada and Quebec as well. So that's, that's the way the situation was uh, and continued for some years after 1968. But it has fundamentally changed since that time. I'm not going to try and uh, uh, analyze the legal doctrine for you. I, to put it in Justice Stratus's terms, I think what happened starting in the 1970s, you get a a theory uh, which has gradually given rise to a doctrine through a process of bootstrapping in which uh, courts have made judgments based on theory and now they then they have precedents to cite. So self-citation has been the uh, the motor here in building a doctrine of, um, of, of Aboriginal title. But anyway, that's uh, technical business for lawyers and I'm not going to try and insult you by <laughs> taking my political scientist view. I just want to mention some of the highlights and then talk about the, the effect of it. So in 1973, you have the Calder case, which uh, gives one of these ambiguous 3-3-1 judgments, but raises the possibility that Aboriginal title, or Indian title as it was still called, uh, continued to exist in British Columbia. Also around this time, you have the agitation over the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline which led to the appointment of the Berger Commission and a moratorium on pipeline construction and ultimately uh, prevented the pipeline from ever being built because by the time all of that was cleared away, then we were into the new age with new legal hurdles and the pipeline couldn't survive the new legal hurdles. So it's never been built. So I have to say thank you, University of Toronto, for that. Uh, the uh, Dene agitation over the pipeline was stoked by people from the political economy department of the University of Toronto, Mel Watkins and the boys. They may have cooked it up in Harthouse for all I know. Uh, and I must say Harthouse seems to have, a, and University of Toronto seems to have a funny kind of love-hate relationship with hydrocarbons. On the one hand, the university wants to divest itself of ownership of oil and gas stocks. But on the other hand, they're burning oil or gas, I don't know which, but they're burning something like crazy in order to overheat this building. <laughs> so I don't know what's going on. Um, 1982, we get the uh, passage of the charter and then the, the section 35, which is not 
in the charter, but it's close to the charter, uh, uh, entrenchment of the Constitution of existing Aboriginal and treaty rights, and that really strengthened the court's hands, uh, sort of a quantum leap in litigation and decisions after 1982. Um, around 1990, you have the BC's fisheries cases, which recognized unextinguished uh, Aboriginal property rights, but not title, not actual ownership of land, but right to harvest fish in various circumstances. So those are a kind of property right, and they get recognized around 1990. 1997, the Delgamook case recognizes the possibility that Aboriginal title still exists in British Columbia. It didn't award or recognize Aboriginal title in any particular area. Excuse me. It just said that uh, Aboriginal title had not been extinguished and may still exist. So it raises this possibility. Um, 2005, the, have the Haida Nation case um, creates the uh, the duty to consult. The theory behind the and there is kind of a logic behind that is if that Aboriginal title is still out there and it's unextinguished, then it would be wrong to um, decrease the value of the land by let's say by mining or cutting the timber or uh, catching all the fish that are in the rivers that flow through the land or pumping out the oil and gas. It would be wrong to do those things, stripping the value of the land, then later maybe turn it over to the First Nations. So they should be consulted before there is uh, there's economic development. Uh, around the same time, you get the Miccosoo Cree case, which extends the duty to consult outside of British Columbia. It starts as a, a kind of a correlate of unextinguished Aboriginal title. But uh, it's then extended by the Supreme Court uh, in the specific instance of Treaty 8. The Treaty 8, like many treaties, uh, gives the signatories the right to hunt, fish, and trap on Crown land, which is not part of their reserve, until that land is taken up by the Crown for other purposes. So for decades, that was interpreted as a uh, you know, a right of the Crown to appropriate Crown land when it chose. But in 2005 said before the Crown does this, it has to consider the impact on these rights of uh, sort of residual harvesting rights, which were, were mentioned in the treaty. Of course, treaties were constitutionalized by the Section 35 in, uh, in 1982. So now these residual harvesting rights become constitutional property rights. and. First Nations have to be consulted before those rights are affected. So this, in, uh, in effect, ex, um, extended the duty to consult across all treaty areas, which means the prairies, Ontario, um, and so forth. And uh, and when it's that wide, it, ha it in effect becomes universal. Um, 2014, the Chilcotin case actually for the first time awards Aboriginal title to a specific piece of land, to a specific group of First Nations, Chilcotin people. And then since then, there's been another case whose name escapes me. Uh, I couldn't pronounce it anyway, even if I had put it in my notes. But for the first time, uh, the courts have authorized a First Nation to pursue a private party for compensation for uh, injuries they suffered as a result of use of their land uh, in an earlier period. It's a, it's a power company which authorized to, by the government of British Columbia to uh, uh, build a dam and generate power. And the local First Nations said, yeah, but that affected our salmon rights, salmon fishing. And so instead of uh, suing the Crown, the courts have authorized them to sue the power company. This opens the door, and I don't know how far this path will go, but it opens the door to um, uh, litigation against private owners. And when you think about it, I mean, if Aboriginal title was never extinguished, what business did the Crown have granting private property rights of any sort, anywhere? So uh, logically, we may see a new generation of litigation directed at uh, private landowners or owners of leases and forestry concessions and that sort of thing. Uh, this is all very new, and I, you know, I have no idea where it will go. Now. Uh, to try and express my view on this, I, I am not opposed to the recognition of Aboriginal rights and title. I actually think that the native people of British Columbia did get a very bad deal. Uh, 
the government proceeded as if they had no property rights. Um, basically, the government just moved in and took over everything and told the Indians, well, you can live here if you want, uh, and you can keep fishing maybe as long as there's any fish left, but uh, there were no rights recognized. I think that was wrong. I think the native people of British Columbia uh, did have rights that could have been cognizable in common law. They had well-established fishing places, uh, for example. Fishing wasn't random. Uh, they fished in certain places on certain rivers and streams. Uh, they improved streams to improve spawning habitat. They, in other words, they invested in property. Uh, that Those rights could have been recognized, and they weren't. And by comparison, in the rest of Canada, um, there was a recognition of uh, Indian rights and title, and there was a process of negotiating for cession of those rights in the treaty. So I think by comparison, the natives of British Columbia were, were very badly served. Now, the historical reasons why that happened, but, but it happened. So I'm not opposed in principle to, um, to trying to do something about that. But if the courts, it seems to me, are going to try and rectify uh, vast historical injustices like that by creating a new generation of property rights, they should try to create property rights that become fungible in a modern economy. Uh, Peter mentioned the Coase theorem, says it actually doesn't matter who owns stuff as long as transaction costs are low enough that the parties who own stuff can engage in voluntary exchange. You can still arrive at an efficient economic outcome as long as voluntary exchange is possible. But if transaction costs are very high, uh, or put, let me put it another way, the higher transaction costs are, the more difficult it becomes to engage in profitable exchanges. And it's almost as if Canadian courts set out to say, how can we make transaction costs as high as possible? Under the name of recognizing uh, Aboriginal title and other forms of property rights, such as fishing rights and other kinds of harvesting rights, how can we make it as difficult as possible for future generations to engage in exchanges involving these property rights? So when, transa when transaction costs go up, typically what you get is delay, and of course time is money, and windows sometimes close permanently, like with the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline, what happened with the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline first uh, um, was that it was postponed for 20 years because of the moratorium while all the Denny rights were investigated. Then the, uh, the, the, there were a series of land claim settlements uh, in the north, and the Denny rights were established. And then most of the Denny became in favor of the, of the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline. By now, we're into the first part of this, of this century. But there were some holdout groups um, that still felt they hadn't been properly consulted. And by this time, Haida Nation <laughs> had come into, into being. So the holdouts went back to court and got a declaration that there had to be more consultation. And by the time the round, new round of consultation was, uh, was finished, shale gas had been discovered. So all that gas in the Arctic, maybe it will be used someday, I don't know, but certainly not in any foreseeable future, uh, because now it's all it's all shale gas. Um, so delay uh, raises costs and sometimes kills projects altogether. Then you have negotiation costs. Uh, the duty to consult in particular is um, uh, imposing enormous costs. Uh, it's also creating interesting new careers. Many of my students now at, in the public <coughs> policy program at the University of Calgary are going into that field. <laughs> Companies, everybody now has to have negotiators. To, they, they call it, and uh, they keep looking for, for uh, uh, new names for it. The latest name is engagement, uh, people to do, to do Aboriginal engagement. Uh, then you also create the possibility of retros retrospective reviews by third parties. That is, an agreement is reached, but then some dissatisfied person uh, criticizes the agreement and then goes into the court system to get a injunction or uh, some sort of legal instrument which slows things up further. So all these things happen. Um, so what is it about this new world of Aboriginal property rights and title which uh, uh, is raising transaction costs? Well, there's a number of different things and I, I can't hit them all, but let me mention some of the main ones. 
um, first of all, every claim to title or any every claim to harvesting rights of fishing or f trapping, whatever, uh, has to be proved in court with detailed historical evidence. Now, at the rate at which these cases are proceeding, this will take centuries. There's about 200 First Nations in British Columbia. There's been one award of Aboriginal title to Chilcotin people. Um, well, one down, 199 to go. Uh, and that took decades for the Chilcotin. You have to amass um, historical, anthropological, linguistic, genetic evidence about occupancy and, and uh, so forth. It takes years to get the evidence. It takes years to uh, to get a, a decision in court. I mean, it's a very, very slow business. In the meantime, uh, nobody knows where Aboriginal title might someday be declared, but we now know after the most recent decision that if you are authorized by the province to use that land, in the meantime, you might be subject to a suit for damages later if the Aboriginal title or, or rights are ever awarded. Uh, it's a great it's a great living for consultants. I mean, I used to love doing this work uh, when I did some of this for, uh, for the Crown. Years of detailed historical research on specifics of the, of the ancient past, and uh, you know, it's well paid and it's a lot of fun. But uh, does it serve the larger economy? Uh, I don't think it does. Um, does that matter? It served me. Uh, <laughs> that we could debate that as well. <laughs> um, secondly, the duty to consult is formulated in extraordinarily vague terms that virtually invite judicial challenge. Uh, first of all, the key concept here is the honor of the crown. The, the, the duty to consult is deduced from the so-called honor of the crown, which until recent years had been a very kind of marginal uh, concept in Canadian and British law, and suddenly is moved on to the center stage. But nobody knows what it really means until the courts tell you what it means in any particular case. You know, they use these generalities. The court, Crown doesn't engage in sharp dealings. The Crown always tells the truth, et cetera, et cetera. But these are just abstractions. Uh, you have to look at the, uh, the details of, of a particular transaction to see whether the honor of the Crown has been served. Uh, so that's the central concept in the duty to consult is honor of the Crown. And by its very nature, it's, uh, it's not well defined. Uh, complicating the matter further is the idea of the spectrum analysis. If you've read the Haida uh, Nation or related cases, you'll be familiar with the spectrum analysis. The Supreme Court deliberately said, well, you know, we can't, we can't say in advance what uh, adequate consultation is. It's going to depend on the situation. You have some situations where the impact of a development may be very slight, uh, where the native people haven't used that land very much in the past. Uh, at the other extreme, you could have a development that may fundamentally transform this area of land where native people have lived for centuries and it's going to destroy their fishing and their, their, um, their hunting and their trapping and everything, and that's a very invasive kind of thing. And so the degree of consultation depends upon all these factors. But, and the court said, this can only be done on a case-by-case -case basis. So more make work for lawyers, more make work for consultants. Nobody knows in advance what is adequate consultation. It's the courts have basically said, okay guys, go consult. We reserve the right to tell you whether it's been adequate or not. Um, so the spectrum analysis is by its very nature um, unclear. Then Aboriginal title has repeatedly been said by the courts to be sui generis. Fortunately, as an altar boy, I know Latin, and sui generis means of its own kind or unique. Well, thanks a lot, Supreme Court, by uh, creating a new form of property which is different from all other known forms of property so that existing property law can't apply to it. And again, what does it mean? Well, the court is basically just making it up. Um, they're, they are telling us uh, what are the sui generis aspects of it. Uh, the four that have been repeatedly mentioned in cases like Delgamook through Chilcotin, that Aboriginal title is collective. Uh, now, what does this mean? Does it mean that it can never be privatized to individuals? Uh, that's unclear. Uh, what it does seem to mean, though, is that there has to be a collective decision-making process regarding the use of it. 
So in the case of Chilcotin, for example, Chilcotin are a collection of, of um, First Nations or legally Indian bands uh, who have a kind of a tribal entity above them. Now who's going to control the land which has been declared to be uh, Chilcotin Aboriginal title land? Well, they're, they're tribal collectivity, so it's a double collectivity. First, it's a, it's, it's a confederation of the, of the bands. It's uh, a, a very cumbersome decision-making structure, not particularly well suited to, uh, to the modern business world. Uh, it's inalienable. That is, it can't be sold except to the crown. This is a conceit going back to the uh, Royal Proclamation of 1763 that um, Aboriginal people could only sell their land to the crown. Well, you only have one possible buyer for your land. Uh, that's um, uh, cumbersome to say the least and, and reduces the potential value of it. Um, but it gets worse. Uh, the land has to be used for Aboriginal purposes only. You can't do something on Aboriginal title land which would destroy its usefulness for future Aboriginal life. Now what does that mean? Um, could, you, uh, could you have a pipeline crossing it? Well, maybe if the pipeline is unobtrusive. Uh, what about a big mine? Well, you know, maybe if the mine yielded so much revenue that the revenue could be used to enhance the wild habitat elsewhere. Like, no, no, these are questions, none of which have any obvious answers, but they're all open to third-party review by, uh, uh, by the courts or commissions of one kind or another. And then, finally, there's the doctrine of infringement. In, in every one of these decisions, the courts have taken uh, care to emphasize that uh, Aboriginal title is not absolute that it could be infringed by the Crown. And so if you really needed some development, like a pipeline or a road or a power corridor or what, you know, I, and actually the court has gone even further. It, it's, um, I mean, it's even worse than the Kelo case in the United States. The court has said that uh, infringement could be done for uh, economic development or for the settlement of new populations. Uh, any reason, really, that government chooses. So it's, uh, it, it's kind of like uh, um, a theory of eminent domain, but it's, it's totally unspecified. Like there's no statutes that govern this. It's unclear how it would be done. Could it be done by which government, first of all, provincial or federal? Could it be done by order and council? Would it require legislation? Would it require constitutional amendment? Um, I mean, all these questions could be answered someday, but by then we may as well move to Australia. Uh, probably a good idea anyway as I look out the window. Um, so there are all these just pyramids of unanswered questions surrounding these new rights that have been created. Uh, and it seems to have been deliberate uh, on the part of the courts. They have repeatedly said, they've talked about how limited the decision-making ability of the Supreme Court is. Say we can't answer these questions. These are going to have to be answered in the future on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, yes, I can understand that, but in the meantime, uh, huge tracts of land are being locked up, essentially, um, making economic development very, uh, very difficult. Now, if we look in more detail at the results, I think we can say that many individual projects are still going ahead. Companies are dealing with the First Nations, even though actually, according to law, it's a government responsibility. But in reality, uh, the, the, the negotiations are done largely by the, by the companies. And uh, they're negotiating uh, impact and benefit agreements for particular mines, particular oil fields, uh, particular forestry projects. And these impact and benefit agreements usually involve some transfer of cash to the band, um, uh, hiring agreements, sometimes training programs, um, set-asides for contracting. Uh, and sometimes these agreements actually work quite well. And so companies and individual First Nations do get together for uh, mutually profitable transactions. I think uh, s some transactions get blocked of course, but many are getting uh, approved. They probably are all uh, 
more expensive because more time has to be spent on negotiations. But, but overall, I would say it's not, it's a situation that industry can live with. Um, smaller companies do it in a very informal way. They hire some local broker who promises to, you know, give some money to the chief's annual golf tournament or something. Uh, like smaller First Nations are deluged with these requests. They can't deal with them because there are companies all over the place, you know, wanting to cut seismic lines, wanting to drill for gas, wanting to drill for oil, wanting to cut timber. Um, every, every request is supposed to be uh, reviewed by the First Nation. They don't have anything like the personnel to do it. So they, the smaller ones with smaller companies reach informal agreements. Uh, the big companies that are doing huge, like oil sands projects, of course, they can't operate that way, and they have highly formalized and expensive impact and benefit agreements, but it's probably uh, still cheaper than all the money they're spending to fly people from Newfoundland into work, although that's much less of that now. Uh, so it's one more cost of doing business, and they, and they deal with it. But where the uh, impact is really showing up in what I, I call corridor projects, Corridor projects are pipelines, uh, roads, railways, power, uh, power lines, things like that, that cut across the uh, tr so-called traditional territory. Uh, that's another problem I didn't think to mention, but the concept of traditional territory that you see almost every day in the newspapers is completely undefined. There is no legal definition of traditional territory. And so First Nations make uh, you know, quite expansive claims as to what their, their uh, traditional territories were, and that gets them into the consultation process. So for a major corridor project, you'll have to negotiate with dozens. I don't know if any have had yet faced hundreds, but certainly dozens of First Nations are at the negotiating table. Now, it's in the nature of a pipeline. Uh, <laughs> or a road, it has to go all the way. It's not really any good if it can't go all the way. <laughs> um, so uh, one holdout can, uh, can scuttle a project. Now, if you only have one, maybe you can reroute it, but if you've got a number of holdouts out of dozens, then you, you know, it may just become impossible. So we see what's happening with corridor projects. Uh, Mackenzie Valley Pipeline, I already mentioned, that was the first casualty of the duty to consult. Northern Gateway, uh, I think, is probably dead. Um, and I should emphasize, it's not just this issue of the duty to consult. There also is other forms of opposition to these projects, which might kill them also. But it certainly uh, has facilitated the opposition to have the First Nations with their, with their right to be consulted. And the environmentalists have been using, uh, you know, giving money to First Nations to organize and, and, and uh, uh, proceed in this way. Northern Gateway is dead. In Ontario, uh, I don't know if Ring of Fire is dead, but pretty close to it. I mean, the original proponent is sold out, or trying to sell out, I can't remember which. So maybe it'll be revived someday. That's a what, kind of a round corridor project. You've got to build big circular roads to touch a lot of different bases and and, and a extension of rail lines. It's, it has a lot of the same characteristics. The Petronas LNG facility at, uh, proposed facility at uh, Prince Rupert uh, has been blocked because of the baby salmon in the eelgrass. Um, actually, I'm on the side of the salmon there. Uh, but uh, uh, it's just another example. Uh, they thought they had everything set up, and then the final, the final step was the port facilities, and then the last First Nation wouldn't, wouldn't follow suit on that. Uh, Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline is being opposed. I don't know uh, whether that will be built. Uh, and again, it's not just First Nations. The good citizens of Burnaby, BC are probably more difficult than any First Nation. Um, but First Nations are certainly not making it any easier. Energy East, again, I don't know. And uh, there are other sources of opposition as well. So I'm not blaming everything on, on the these new rights, but I'm saying that um, they have been developed by the courts in such a way, creating a doctrine based on theory and bootstrapping up by citing their own decisions. They have created um, a legal doctrine which seems to maximize transaction costs. And um, what is the solution to this? I have, I have no idea. Um, 
I mean, it would be nice, I think, if courts could recognize uh, a, a, a vigorous market economy as one of the fundamental features of Canadian democracy. Because the courts actually are not shy in many decisions saying, well, you know, we have to interpret this in the light of the fundamental features of Canadian democracy. You get different lists in different cases, but, you know, equality of men and women or recognition of multiculturalism or, or, or federalism. Um, but I've never seen a decision which say, hey, we have to interpret this in the, uh, in the light of the importance of a vigorous market economy for Canada, and therefore we have to craft remedies which will minimize transaction costs rather than maximize them. Now, I don't know if it would have been legally possible, lawyers can tell me uh, or debate it, but you know, say for example, the courts had said, yes, the people of, the native people of British Columbia did suffer a great historical injustice. Um, it's not too late to do something about that. Uh, so they could give a declaratory judgment that this had happened and then suggest that the remedy would lie in some kind of remediation by, uh, to be carried out by the federal government and in conjunction with the provincial government, which might consist of a combination of, of grants of land and payment of cash, but it would not be uh, hundreds of separate negotiations tying up the economy for centuries. It would be a defined process, which could be carried out in, you know, 20 years, which would be lightning speed, warp speed by the standards of, of, uh, of this area of, uh, of, of uh, adjudication. Now, would that have, that's the road that wasn't taken. It's probably too late for that. But I just asked myself, would there have been an alternative uh, way of approaching this that could have uh, recognized the wrong that was done, tried to provide some remedy for that uh, without maximization of transaction costs, which is what we have had. So anyway, um, this is what I see. And uh, I don't know if we have any time for, for questions, maybe a few minutes before we have to leave. Thank you. I've uh, got a quick question. Are, are you familiar with the term Aboriginal industry? Yes. Do you think that plays a role? So for people that are unfamiliar, the, Abor the term Aboriginal industry, what I mean by that is it's a theory that the interests that are trying to help Aboriginal communities, you know, improve their lot are actually uh, contributing to the problem because they, their very existence is reliant on those problems continuing to exist. Yeah. Well, I mean, generally speaking, I'm in favor of industry. Uh, <laughs> and uh, industries will form if incentives are created. And that's what happened is that it's that a combination of legislation and litigation have created incentives for uh, people to, to work as uh, consultants. They can be lawyers, they can be anthropologists, historians, whatever. Um, increasingly, there are negotiators who are required. If you're going to have a duty to consult, you've got to have people that can do it, which may be certain you know, lawyers that like to negotiate rather than fight uh, can be hired, or there are other professional negotiators. So you need different kinds of, of abilities, and there's money to be made, and I was part of it myself for a while, working for the Crown. Uh, so, yeah, I'm familiar with the term, and it's a reality. On the other hand, I think we should be careful not to impugn the individual motives. Uh, the people who engage in these roles are very convinced um, that they're serving the public good. I th think in some cases maybe they're wrong, but they think I'm wrong. So uh, it'd be better not to impugn motives. But there, yeah, the reality is that a large industry has developed around, you know, they've got law schools now offering special programs, Aboriginal law to create more uh, courtroom warriors to go out there and keep suing the, the crown. And uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's, uh, it's a very important phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Malcolm. Yeah, thanks for a really interesting uh, talk. Uh, I'm wondering if you, you sort of see the way out of this as courts explicitly taking policy considerations into, into account, but just different policy considerations, or whether it's some sort of redefinition of principles that would, without explicitly taking policy consequences into account. Because it, it seems to me that at least in this area, courts have been fairly lousy in terms of creatively coming up with policy outcomes. Um, or policy, 
thinking in terms of policy. I mean, one, one interesting sort of aspect of, about the Del Delgamut case is that no one was actually asking for the judicial creativity with respect to the definition of Aboriginal title. The Aboriginal plaintiffs in that case were, were asking for the simple title, mm -hmm. um, and the government was opposing it, but no one was asking for this special sui generis, sort of impossible to use title. And so given the sort of judicial track record in making policy determinations in this area, is that what we want? Or do we want sort of principles-based reasoning? Or is it just better to have government step in with a legislated solution along the lines you said and just hope that it gets upheld as a justified infringement? That's a pretty sprawling question. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, yeah, I actually don't think it's very likely that the, the courts, as we know them, will start to take the Coase theorem into account. Um, maybe in an ideal world, there's things could be done by legislation, but uh, that's extremely difficult because uh, um, it's really constitutional, much of it. We don't know exactly what, what could be addressed by legislation. I mean, for, for example, all the provinces, I think, have tried to pass legislation to sort of uh, regulate the cons consultation, formalize the consultative procedure. In my own province, um, one law was passed, it uh, was attacked as insufficient, and a new proposal was floated, and it was attacked for being a result of insufficient consultation. So now you have to go back and have more consultations about legislation to create a framework for consultation. Um, so I, I think the political process is pretty well gridlocked, to be honest. Politicians are very afraid of this, uh, and I can't blame them. And so actually, I think what will happen, uh, for better or worse, it will be the ingenuity of the market. Pipelines are blocked. Okay, we'll move railway, uh, we'll, we'll move oil on rail lines. Uh, I, it's okay with me. I don't live next to a railway. But um, that's, that's what will happen, is the market will do whatever it can, and, which may work well in some instances, but in other in, instances people may just give up and write off their investments and uh, go somewhere else in the world to invest. But uh, I'm actually not optimistic about either a construct, uh, constructive judicial or legislative response. I think it's going to be up to people in the market to, to do whatever they can. Uh, some, some are able to manage the consultation process. Um, as I said, I think it's working reasonably well in some areas. Uh, people probably get better at it. Um, there are some alternatives to pipelines. So uh, that's about as far as I can uh, uh, see it. But no, I'm actually not optimistic about either the courts or the political process on this. They're the ones who've created all the problems. I think it's unlikely that they will start to solve them. Uh, you kind of answered my question in the latter part. Uh, I just want to talk about duty to consult when companies, I'm from Thunder Bay, so it's quite a unique experience. Yeah. And duty to consult, how far does it have to go when they're faced just with constant confrontation from the other parties? Yeah. Well, the courts, again, have been explicit that uh, duty to consult is not a veto. They've said this several times, that uh, First Nation has a right to be consulted, but the First Nation doesn't have a right to simply refuse all offers and, um, and say, thou shalt not pass. But that's not the way it's understood by First Nations leaders. They interpret it as a veto, as is clear if you pay attention to their statements. So in practice, the duty to consult is a right of veto. Now that gives them a stronger negotiating position. If they're interested in reaching a deal, maybe they can reach a better deal because they start from a stronger position. But there are uh, bands or f factions within bands who are opposed in principle to uh, any kind of deal. And sometimes they have the leverage to block it all together. And I don't, I have yet to see any government in Canada which is willing to override that and to say, I mean, legally it's clear. The government could say duty to consult is not a right of veto and you've been consulted and we're going to push, uh, push this through anyway. But I don't, uh, I don't think that's likely to happen on any major, major kind of project. Um, so what this is on the ground is actually not the same as what it is in the case books. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Adam. You uh, you said that one of the features of Aboriginal title is that it can't be used in a way that will degrade the land for future Aboriginal uses. 
And I'm wondering if that really is as bad as it sounds, because the way you describe it, it's as though the court adopted a noble savage view of who aboriginals are and what they do uh, in order to be genuinely aboriginal. Uh, you know, mines, uh, pipelines, those are white people activities. Mm -hmm. uh, aboriginals hunt, fish, trap, and, and that's it. Mm -hmm. No, and actually the courts have been explicit that this is not a frozen rights theory uh, that um, Aboriginal doesn't mean only uh, hunting and fishing with stone implements. Um, and it could em encompass modern economic or even industrial purposes. But the trouble is it, there's no way of knowing what it could encompass and what it wouldn't encompass. So that what this does is it creates this uncertainty, which then, because the decision-making process has to be collective, it would allow a dissatisfied element within the First Nation to challenge, even if it was a majority approval of, you know, whatever, a clear cut or something, uh, even for a native owned uh, forestry mill, it would allow a dissident faction to, to attack that in court as compromising the quality of the land for future Aboriginal generations. Now, the courts might well s side with the majority. All I'm saying is it's another increase in transaction costs if when you want to do something that you have to figure with the, the possibility that you can be attacked in court on those grounds. It won't necessarily block all uh, uh, economic or industrial activities, but it just it increases possible costs and because of the uncertainty. Yeah. yeah. Professor Flanagan, thank you very much for elucidating us on an extremely complex issue. Um, you know, I guess human history is rife with, uh, you know, Aboriginal disputes over private property. Um, I guess the most recent ones here being Ipperwash and Caledonia that have come to the fore, and um, outside of Canada, Ecuador being a, a particularly egregious example to which uh, famed lawyer Alan Lenzner has dedicated an enormous amount of his firm's resources to fighting Chevron Texaco for dumping oil tailings you know, back in the 60s and 70s over there. Um, my question would be regarding the Indian Act. Uh, you didn't mention it, and again, it's an extremely complex issue. I wanted to know what you think about its specter of repeal, and in general, um, <laughs> whether it's, that's obviously not likely, but what would you think uh, its role plays in whatever and everything that you've discussed and what what are your general thoughts about the Indian Act thank yeah, you yeah well the last time I spoke about the Indian Act I ended up being accused of supporting child pornography and <laughs> <laughs> yeah and that that book is still in print by the way uh, and uh, one that everybody should read but um, I can't, I can't foresee any major, um, uh, major revisions to the Indian Act. It is possible to uh, amend it in minor ways, it has been done, and it's also possible to create workarounds. Um, there's some good legislation, I think, passed in the 1990s, um, giving First Nations who wanted greater control over their own lands to opt out of some Indian Act procedures. So you can get, you can get workarounds and you can get minor amendments. But um, I don't see the, the political basis for repeal or wholesale amendment of the Indian Act because everybody agrees, it's one of the situations where everybody agrees that the Indian Act is bad, but people fundamentally disagree about what should be done to replace it. Um, now, of course, there is a way around that. It's the Justin Trudeau approach. You say, this is the last election that Canada will, it will be held in Canada under first past the post. Uh, yeah, you could, you could probably get people to vote for somebody who said, uh, we're going to re repeal the Indian Act. But what, what you, you have to have something in its place because uh, Indian reserves are like rural municipalities scattered all around the country, except that they are constitutionally under federal jurisdiction. And so there has to be some legislation to guide that. Uh, you can't just have uh, federal officials, you know, wheeling money out there without any kind of rules about how it's spent. So there has to be something like an Indian Act, as long as you have First Nations as 
constitutionally separate. And, and again, we made that decision in 1982. I was opposed to it, but we made it. So uh, it's, it, it's not going to go away. So um, I, I think we're gridlocked on the Indian Act, and I, 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 I support small scale efforts to tweak it or to create workarounds. I think that's about the best that we can do. One of the other books you wrote was on privatizing reserves. Could you give us a brief update on how that is proceeding across the country? Well, like almost everything else I've ever failed, it's completely blocked. Ever favored, it's completely blocked. Um, it wasn't to privatize reserves, actually. The, the, the book is Beyond the Indian Act. Um, it was to create an opportunity for First Nations who wanted it, and it would be only voluntary, to assume collective ownership of their reserve. Now reserves are crown land. The Indians don't own them. Uh, they would have the opportunity to own them as a collectivity and to create title in fee simple uh, on them if they wished, as the Nishka, in fact, are doing on a small scale. Mm. And uh, for a while, it looked as if uh, that legislation, which was part of the book, the Ideas for Legislation, and all of this was being pushed by the First Nations Tax Commission and its chief, Manny Jules. He was actually the real proponent. I was just kind of a mouthpiece. Um, it looked like it was going to go ahead. The conservative government had uh, grabbed the idea, and a lot of important people spoke in favor of it, the Minister of Finance and members of, of the House of Commons and so forth. And it was on the agenda, but then Idle No More came along, and everybody got scared. Now, Idle No More was opposed to all sorts of stuff, but among the huge list of things to which they were opposed would have been the First Nations Property Ownership Act. I can't see the liberals uh, introducing anything like that. They might conceivably have let it pass if somebody else would introduce it, but I, I, I can't see them introducing it. So I think that idea is uh, dead for our life, my lifetime, your lifetime. Now, maybe some of the younger people here, you know, 30 or 40 years from now, you might see uh, a rebirth of the idea, but I, in my lifetime, I'm not going to see it. My question is about decision making for collectively owned property. You've alluded to the difficulties that there might be with that, uh, dissident factions and the complicated system that exists um, in BC for the Silcotin, I believe is the name. Yeah, Chilcotin, yeah. Chilcotin. Um, so my, my question is, is there any recognizably or arguably or demonstrably legitimate form of decision making for that kind of property? So the system you described, for example, um, it sounded as though you had the first level was banned councils for individual bans, and the next level was their umbrella organization. Mm -hmm. So for example, why would a banned council, which I, I, I might be wrong, but I understand to be basically a statutory entity created by the Indian Act. Yes. Why would it have any authority to make decisions that would impact the uh, use of property that's collective, that's not created by the Indian Act, that's collectively owned by a collective that's different from and larger than a particular band? Yeah. If there is any answer. That well, these, yeah, I don't know the answer. These are all good questions that arise out of the Chilcotin decision. Now, I'm sure something will evolve to uh, provide an answer of sorts. But um, what, whatever evolves, I suspect, will not be simple and uh, easy to operate. Uh, yeah, the Indian Act provides decision-making procedures, uh, which were slightly simplified by the past uh, parliament. But um, basically, it involves a referendum or some kind of direct democracy consultation for major changes in land status, like if you want to uh, sign a major lease. Uh, uh, or sell, surrender land to the Crown for sale. It has to be approved in a referendum. Then it has to go to the minister for approval. It's pretty, pretty complicated. Uh, but, and uh, so transaction costs are high there, but you know, some th things do get done eventually. Um, so we just don't know in the case of Aboriginal title what the decision-making procedures would be. They, they might well turn out to be similar to what exists under the Indian Act, in which case, uh, maybe they would work okay. I'm, I'm just saying for the moment, we don't know, and it's one more source of uncertainty. 